Cambridge. Would you please stand for the reading of God's Word. From Deuteronomy 32, starting in verse 35, these are the words of the Lord. Vengeance is mine and recompense. For the time when their foot shall slip, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and their doom comes swiftly. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants when he sees that their power is gone and there is none remaining, bond or free. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. This is not our passage today. That was just from Deuteronomy 32. We're actually going to be in 1 Samuel chapters 23 through 26. You can turn there now. But I wanted us to start off with this passage because I believe that David in today's passage is going to have Deuteronomy in mind all throughout. Because in today's passage, the topic at hand is the word vengeance. The Lord declares, vengeance is mine. I've been thinking about that word vengeance a lot lately because I think these days, we don't really know what to do with the word vengeance. We don't know what to do with vengeance. On the one hand, we have folks who say, vengeance is a bad word. We'll call this the anti-vengeance side. A lot of these people say, look, you shouldn't ever want vengeance. You should always forgive and forget. You should, you should never hold it against someone when injustice and oppression and sin is done. Instead, you should turn a blind eye. I think we can all see some of the problems with that perspective. It can weaponize forgiveness. It can lead to believers being doormats. It can excuse abuse. It can leave the oppressed in a powerless position, and it can enable the oppressors. I don't think we can be anti-vengeance, not when the Lord declares that vengeance is his. But on the other hand, you have... Folks who say, vengeance by any means. We'll call these the extreme vengeance side. For them, vengeance is the same as justice. For them, people getting what they deserve is the highest good. If you get punched, what do you do? You punch back. If you are insulted, what do you do? You repay them with insult. We see this in, in, in all of our culture. So many movies are based around revenge. We don't live in a society where we have revenge killings or honor killings. But I think a lot of us enjoy seeing it, crave it, yearn for it. In the latest Batman movie, what does Batman say? He says, I'm vengeance. I don't think either the anti-vengeance or the extreme vengeance side gets it entirely right. As we'll see, both sides are problematic. Both of them don't quite get something about the biblical picture. But it's these two sides that I think David is wrestling with in today's passage. Today we have four chapters that we're looking at, and the common thread in all four of these chapters is one word the word hand. It appears 32 times in these four chapters. And the key question that will be asked throughout all four of these chapters is whose hands should take vengeance? Whose hands should take vengeance? There's a lot of text that we're working through today. So buckle up. Let's get started. Starting in chapter 23 with verse 1. Now they told David, behold, the Philistines are fighting against Calah, 
and are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore, David inquired of the Lord, shall I go and attack these Philistines? All right, so where are we in the story right now? Where, where have we seen so far in the story of David? David has just experienced a meteoric rise, right? He, he, we all know how the story starts. He, he gets five stones and he goes up a little boy against this huge giant and with, with just a few sling stones, he takes out the most powerful warrior in the whole area. He takes out Goliath. And from that point on, David's career is success after success. Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Now that makes King Saul... Jealous, envious, paranoid. Saul literally tries to pin David with a spear. Saul issues a nationwide manhunt for the person he sees as the biggest threat to him and his family. And so David's on the run at the beginning of this story. David is hiding in the wilderness, living as a fugitive going from cave to cave, and he's formed a resistance movement. He's gathered around himself 400 men, and, and, and they're just doing their best to stay alive. But through all of this, as we've read, David trusts God. And now we come here to chapter 23, and something interesting is happening. <clears throat> because someone tells David, the Philistines are fighting against the city of Calah and are robbing the threshing floors. Now, if you're in David's shoes, if you're, if you're being hunted in a nationwide manhunt, you want to keep a low profile. You, you, you don't want to stir up any noise. You want to kind of go under the radar, but not David. David's first thought is he goes to the Lord and he asks, shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord says to David in verse 2, go and attack the Philistines and save Caleb. David's men aren't sold. In verse 3, David's men said to him, Behold, we're afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we go to Cala against the armies of the Philistines? But we're, we're in our home turf right now, and even here, we're not safe. How much more if we go to where the enemy is strongest? <clears throat> so David asked God again. David inquires of the Lord again. And the Lord answered him, Arise. Go down to Kayla, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. It's the first time that we see that word hand. God says, I will give the enemy into your hand. God is in control in this moment of who, who it falls into whose hand. And so David and his men went to Kayla and fought with the Philistines and brought away their livestock and struck them with a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Calah. God was with David. God brought the Philistines into his hand. God was in control. And that's going to come in handy because David's actions don't stay under the radar. In verse 6, when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, had fled to David to Calah, he had come down with an ephod in his hand. Now it was told Saul that David had come to Calah, and Saul said, God has given him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. And Saul summoned all the people to war, to go down to Kayla to besiege David and his men. Okay, first off, where was Saul when the city of Kayla needed him? Isn't this ironic? He, he's, he's mustering up all of his armies, getting everyone to come out in arms against David. Shouldn't he have been doing that when the city was under attack by the Philistines? Saul's priorities are not on straight. Saul is paranoid. Saul has tunnel vision. All he sees, the only threat in his mind is David. He is not doing his job as king. And moreover, Saul's spiritual vision is off right now. Saul looks at the circumstance. He sees, oh, David has got himself into a trap. He's locked himself in a walled town that has gates and bars. I got him. Big mistake, David. God has given him into my hand, is what Saul says. But Saul has spiritual blindness. He does not see the whole picture. 
verse 8, and Saul's, uh, verse 9, David knew that Saul was plotting harm against him. And he said to Abiathar, the priest, bring the ephod here. Then said David, O Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come to Calah to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Calah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord, the God of Israel, please tell your servant. In other words, will the people who I've helped betray me? Will they give me up? David has learned trust, but confirm. <clears throat> and the Lord said, he will come down. Saul will come down. But David asked two questions and God only answered one. So David says, okay, will the men of Calah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will surrender you. Then David and his men, who were about 600 by now, arose and departed from Calah and they went wherever they could go. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Calah, he gave up the expedition and David remained in the strongholds in the wilderness, in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God did not give him into his hand. The main point of this whole chapter, of 20, chapter 23, is that we are in God's hands. We are in God's hands. Who falls into our hands? It depends. Whoever God lets fall into our hands. Will we fall into someone else's hands? It depends. Will God let us fall into their hands? All of it, all of it attests to the fact that we are in God's hands. What happens to us is determined by the Lord and David knows this. That's why David inquires of the Lord, but Saul does not. Saul just sees strategy. Saul just sees the circumstances and assumes based on that, that God has given him into his hand. But as we're told, God did not give David into Saul's hand. And there's a lesson there. Folks, Bridge, when we try to make our decisions, when we, when we try to figure out how to get the situation into our hand, are we relying on ourselves, on our strategic intuition, on our business acumen, or are we inquiring of the Lord? Are we taking things for granted? Are we going to God and saying, God, we know we're in your hands, and so we trust you. We need you to give us, we need to rely on you. Are we acting more like Saul or are we acting like David? David is the kind of king that Israel needs. And that's affirmed in the next section, verse 15. David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horesh. And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. Here's another point that we're going to see over and over again in today's passage. God will strengthen our hand through others. Isn't that true? God uses our brothers and sisters, the family of God, to strengthen us in, in God. Verse 17, and he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel. For the first time, in this passage, we see Jonathan affirm that, Saul, that David will be king over Israel. And that's, that's, a, that's a crazy statement because it doesn't look like David's going to be king of Israel. David has 600 men compared to the whole nation of Israel. He is living on the run. He is a fugitive. If you were to just crunch the numbers, just, just look at the situation, who has the upper hand? Who's going to win? Who's going to be the king of Israel? Saul. But Jonathan knows. Jonathan sees what his dad can't, that David will be the king over Israel. We'll see two other people affirm that fact later on. The rest of this chapter, we're not going to read. If we had time, we would. But it all is, is another example over and over again of God holding David in his hand and saving him. David will fall into the hands of the people of Ziph. They're going to say, hey, Saul, David's in our land. If you come, we'll, we'll disclose his location. We'll hunt him down for you. And Saul rejoices. He thinks he's got him, but God preserves David. At the last minute, God is going to distract Saul with Philistines, people that Saul should have been fighting, and David's going to be able to escape. And that brings us to chapter 24. If chapter 23 established that we are in God's hands, chapter 24 will begin the first of three temptations of David. David is in the wilderness, and he will face three temptations, and in each temptation, David is going to be tested with the question, in whose hand is vengeance? 
Am I in God's hands? Can I trust him? And should I take vengeance into my hands? Should David take matters into his own hands? Let's start with verse 1 of chapter 24. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. And Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel. These are his like SWAT team. This is his Navy SEALs, his crack team. They're, they're ready to go and to take David out. They have been trained in, in, in all the highest martial arts. They, they got this. And they went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rock. And he came to the sheepfolds by the way where there was a cave and Saul went in to relieve himself. Okay. Okay. Saul's just going in for a bathroom break. But unfortunately, that was a bad strategic move for Saul. Verse uh, uh, four, continuing on. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. Now the cave that David goes in to to take take a little bit of a relief, that's where David is. That's where he and his men have been sealed up. They're hiding. Saul has no idea. He goes in, right? He's leaning up against the wall, And back in the corner, back in the darkness is David and his men. And they're like, oh my goodness. (laughs) This is, this is a sign of anything. Look at the circumstances. Look at the strategic opportunity that is before you, David. The men, verse four, the men of David said to him, here is the day of which the Lord said to you, behold, I will give your enemy into your hand and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Okay, now hold on. If we read closely, if we try to think back, has God ever said this to David? Uh, I don't think we see this anywhere in the past. Anywhere in, in, at least I haven't found it in the text. The men, the men of David, they're trying to get into their shoes. What are they thinking? This is a once in a lifetime opportunity, David. He has no idea. You have the element of surprise. He's got his back to you. You could take him out right now. You could take him out right now. You could end all of our problems. We have been on the run for months. We are hungry. We are starving. We don't feel safe. You could end all of that right now. They say, God has clearly given your enemy into your hand. Do to him what seems good to you. And the problem with that is this is Saul-like thinking. Remember the last chapter? Saul saw the circumstances. Saul saw the strategic opportunity. David had locked himself into a walled city. Clearly, God's given him to my hand. David is being tempted with the same kind of temptation that Saul was. Look at the strategic opportunity. Has God given him into your hand? So David, he's listening to his men. And the verse continues, David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Okay, he, he, he doesn't have quite the wherewithal to, to take the plunge. He starts with the robe. And in that moment, in that moment, verse five, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now, what's going on here? Because after all, isn't David justified in, to, in, in taking vengeance here? Shouldn't David take matters into his own hands? Doesn't he have every reason to take Saul out right then and there? After all, this is a great opportunity. After all, he is the rightful king. He is God's anointed. After all, it's him or me, right? I mean, either Saul, Saul is, is, is gonna kill you or you're gonna kill Saul. It's gonna be one way or the other. This is a win-lose situation, David. You do the math. After all, He deserves it. He tried to kill you first. He threw a spear at your head, David. You are not safe. After all, isn't our God a God of vengeance? Wouldn't this be justice? If someone tries to kill you, you try to kill them. But David's conscience stops him. Look at what he says in verse 6. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed. To put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. 
So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. David's reasoning is this. Look, Saul may not be a good king. He may not be acting like a king. I might be the next king in line, but nevertheless, Saul is the rightful king right now. He has been anointed. The people of Israel have chosen him. He's in this position of authority. Do I have a right to take him out? Think about that question, Bridge. Do, do, do I have a right to disacknowledge the authority of this man? This seems like a very removed kind of situation, but, but Bridge, I have been alive for, what, four or five elections cycles in my whole life. And, and I, I can't remember a single time where I, I should not have been able to vote for four or five election cycles. I can't remember a single time where people did not contest the results of the election and say, even after it's been proven, that this is not the rightful, rightful leader. Not my president, right? Or, or what do they say? Uh, let's go, Pastor Brandon. Is that what they say? <laughs> this is not a Christian response. This is not a biblical response to authority. We are told to pray for those in leadership. And here, David, even with a king as bad as Saul, David says, I will not lift my hand against the Lord's anointed. There are very deep implications of that, but I'll let you work that out in your bridge groups. David will not raise his hand against Saul. David will not do it. Let's see what happens. Verse eight, afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, my Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, behold, David seeks your harm? Remember, David has not actually sought to be king. David has been anointed. He is, he is perfectly happy to just work for Saul, to be his commander. He was the, the commander in chief of his army. And David was Saul's son-in-law. And so in David's mind, he could very well become king just by being the next king. There's no reason that he has to take out Saul. There's no reason this animosity, this hostility needs to happen. Don't trust the guys who are saying David seeks your harm, Saul. Verse 10, behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father. See the corner of your robe in my hand, for by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there was no wrong or treason in my hands. David said, I had every opportunity. You had your back against the wall. I could have done this. I could have taken you out right then and there, and I didn't, Saul. This is not who I am. Here's the proof. Even though you hunt my life to take it, is what he says. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. There is no wrong or treason in my hands. I'm in God's hands. I don't need to have wrong or treason in my hands. Even though God gave, me, gave you into my hands, I would not lift my hand against you. You see that word popping up over and over again? And then in verse 12, David says this, may the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. I'm not going to do it. It wouldn't be right for me to do this. This would be an assassination. And I'm not authorized to do that, but I'll let the Lord avenge me. Verse 13, as the proverb of the ancients say, out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea, I'm nothing. Why are you hunting me, Saul? I'm not a threat to you. May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from, my, from your hand. I'm in God's hands. I'm not afraid of you, Saul. I'll let him judge. As soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, is this your voice, my son, David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. 
He said to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. You've repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. This is stunning. This is the kind of king that David will be, repaying good for evil. Verse 18, that you have declared this day how you have dealt well with me and that you did not kill me when the Lord had put me in your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now behold, I know that you shall surely be king. The second person to declare in today's passage that David will be king is Saul himself. You shall surely be king. David has not raised his hand against Saul. His conscience wouldn't allow him to kill the Lord's anointed. David does not take vengeance into his own hands in this chapter. But what happens when it's not Saul, but someone else who offends David? What happens when David can't use the excuse, oh, this is the Lord's anointed? What happens when David's presented with a situation to take vengeance into his own hands and There's nothing else stopping him. What's David going to do? Our second temptation today in chapter 25, David will be pressed again, tempted again to take matters into his own hands. Verse one, now Samuel died and all Israel assembled and mourned for him and they buried him in his house at Ramah. End of an era. This is really where this should be called the book of first David or something, but here, Samuel's dead. The, 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 the judges are ended. The prophet is gone. And now it's just David. Then David rose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel. The man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He was shearing his sheep in Carmel. So 3,000 sheep, what's that? He's, this guy is like an investment banker. He owns a million businesses, he's, a, he's got, he's an angel investor. He, this, is, this guy's a big deal. Okay, he's, he's got money to throw around. He, he is well to do. Now the man, the name of the man was Nabal and the name of his wife, Abigail. The woman was discerning and beautiful, but the man was harsh and badly behaved. He was a Calebite. David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent 10 young men and David said to the young men, go up to Carmel and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus you shall greet him. Peace be to you, and peace be to your house, and peace be to all that you have. I hear that you have shearers. Now your shepherds have been with us, and we did them no harm, and they missed nothing all the time they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever you have at hand to your servants and to your son, David. Okay, so what is the request right now? Rich man, Nabal, right, investment banker, gorgeous trophy wife, Abigail, super smart, super godly. And David comes up to them and he says, we just need a little bit of food. Okay, we just need a little bit of food to get us through this season. We know you have a ton of food. This is the, the time of shearing. This is like, this is, this is end of fiscal year. You're, you're, you're doing good right now. You've, you've been able to see that your, your profit margins have been great. Just give us a little bit, please. We're begging. We're on our hands and knees. And, and, and guess what? We, we actually did you a service. We, we, we protected your men. We were, we were your security uh, for a while. And, and guys, back then, that was a serious thing because you, if you were doing your, your profit loss margins, if you were counting things up, you, you would always include a little line item for bandits. You, you would include a little line item. Like, okay, yeah, so like we're... We're, we're, we're definitely going to lose some money to just like bandits, people coming in and just stealing sheep and killing people. And, and David said, look, we, we did you a service here. I, 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 I just want a little bit of food. How is Nabal going to respond? When David's young men came, they said all this to Nabal in the name of David. This is verse nine. And then they waited. And Nabal answered David's servants, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? Who do you think you are? There are many servants these days who are breaking away from their masters. 
Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I've killed from my shears and give it to men who come from I don't know where? Look, I don't know you. I don't know who you are. I don't need to show hospitality to you. So David's young men turned away and came back and told him all this. And David said to his man, every man strap on his sword. Get the posse together. Let's get our guns, guys. This is, this is it. This is the final straw. I am done. I am finished. This is an insult. This is an offense. And, and, and this, is, this is out of pocket. This isn't called for. Guys, we've done nothing but, but kindness, but goodness to this man. And, and, and here he is treating me like an animal, worse than an animal. He feeds his animals. He's not even going to feed me. And every man of them strapped on his sword. David also strapped on his sword. And about 400 men went up after David, while 200 remained with the baggage. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to greet our master, and he railed at them. Yet the men were very good to us, and we suffered no harm, and we did not miss anything when we were in the fields, as long as we went with him. They were a wall to us, both by night and by day. All the while we were with them, keeping the sheep. Look, they, they helped us. They, they actually did. No, no bandits came and bothered us because there were these strong-armed men right there. Verse 17, now therefore know this and consider what you should do. For harm is determined against our master and against all his house. And he is such a worthless man that one cannot speak to him. Nabal does not inspire a lot of confidence. Morale is pretty low. He probably doesn't treat his workers right. These people are not happy. And, and, and they know that, that if nothing happens and nothing changes, David and his men are so pissed off, so angry that they're about to come in and wipe all of them out. Verse 18, then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two skins of wine and five sheep already prepared and five seahs of parched grain and a hundred clusters of raisins and 200 kicks of figs and laid them on donkeys. And she said to her young men, go on before me. Behold, I come after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. And as she rode on the donkey and came down under cover of the mountain, behold, David and his men came down towards her. And she met them. Okay, so Abigail, just one lone woman, sees the threat that's about to happen, the danger that's about to come upon her whole household. Here's a hot-headed guy who is not thinking straight. And here's her husband who is being kind of foolish and, and, and needlessly harsh and, and, and offensive. She is between two men who are not thinking. And, and she's like, how... How am I going to calm everyone down? So she very bravely brings a peace offering, prepares the food, comes up to David, goes to him, which, I mean, I don't know if I would do that. I don't know if I would have the guts to, to go up to 400 armed men. You know, they're all toting ARs, and, and, and I just have like, <laughs> I just have like my, my basket of food. And, and, and she, what she's doing right now takes bravery. It takes courage. She meets him in verse 21. Now David had said, surely in vain have I guarded all that this fellow has in the wilderness so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him. And he has returned me evil for good. He has returned me evil for good. I've done nothing but good for him and he's returned me evil. So verse 22, God do so to the enemies of David and more also if by morning I leave so much as one male of all who belong to him. David is out for blood. And why not? Why shouldn't David take matters into his own hands? Why shouldn't David take vengeance? After all, after all, he needs to survive. He needs to feed his men. It's, it's him or me right now. Look, either we don't do this and we die, or, or we do this and we live to see another day. And after all, this guy deserves it. This was uncalled for. This is, this is an offense. We've done nothing but good to him, and he has repaid us evil. He's offended us. He's insulted us. He's treated us like dogs. Whereas in the first chapter, or in the last chapter, 
David's conscience restrained him because remember, he was up against the Lord's anointed. This was his president. This guy had authority. This guy shouldn't have been opposed. But now here he is against a man who is not the king, who, who is not the Lord's anointed. This guy's just some punk who thinks he can do whatever he wants. This, this rich, snotty investment banker who thinks he can lord it over all the rest of us and doesn't, doesn't even want to share a little bit of the much that he has. David's conscience doesn't restrain him this time. But this time, God uses Abigail to restrain him. Let's see what Abigail does. Verse 23, when Abigail saw David, she hurried and got down from the donkey and fell before David on her face and bowed to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, on me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. Which is, that is just so incredible. Abigail could have taken this opportunity and said, all right, I'm out of here. I'm skipping town. I see what's about to go down. I don't want to be involved. This is not on me. I'm, I'm, see you later. Um, but no, Abigail gets into the situation and she says, on me alone be the guilt. If my husband has offended you, I'm sorry, but take it out on me. Kill me instead. On me alone be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. Give me, give me a chance. Just hear what I have to say. Verse 25, let not my Lord regard this worthless fellow Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. It's a, in Hebrew, it's a pun. Nabal means fool. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, your servant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, because the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hand, now then, let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now let this present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your servant. Oh my goodness. Here's a godly woman. Here Abigail is saying, look, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come up to you taking enormous courage. And she says, on me alone be the guilt. I'll, I'll take the fall for this. This, this was out of pocket, but I'll take the fall for this. And then she says, David, if you have it in your heart, don't do this. Don't kill all these men. Calm down. Forgive them, is what she says. Please forgive the trespass of your servant. Don't save by your own hand. Bridge, we ought to all be like Abigail. In, in, in this whole section, in the whole passage we're reading today, she is the shining example of what Christians ought to do. We ought to all be peacemakers. To encourage others to trust God, to forgive those who sin against us. To not take salvation into our own hands, but to trust the Lord. Abigail here reminds David that vengeance is the Lord. Look what she says. Verse 29, if men rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living and the care of the Lord your God. And your enemies he shall sling out, and the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the hollow of a sling. And when the Lord has done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you prince over Israel, the third person to declare that David will be king, Abigail. Verse 31, my Lord shall have no cause of grief or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause or for my Lord taking vengeance himself. And when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your servant. She's saying, don't do something you'll regret, David. Don't do something that will tarnish your reputation. That later on when you become king, you'll say, oh, I became king through ill-gotten means. I became king through vengeance. She's saying, don't take vengeance yourself. Don't take vengeance yourself. Today we started off with a passage that highlights what's going on here. What is Abigail trying to tell David? That vengeance is the Lord's. The Lord declares, vengeance is mine, I will repay 
This is a truth that radically changes how we today ought to view vengeance. Not anti-vengeance, not extreme vengeance. Vengeance is good. God himself says vengeance is his. But also vengeance is not ours. Vengeance is his. Our main point today, if you get one thing, it's this. If we are in God's hands, we don't have to take matters into our own hands. If we are in God's hands, we don't have to take matters into our own hands. That's the main point. That's what I want you to take away. Romans 12 says this. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Bridge, we're offended all the time. We are insulted all the time. People sin against us all the time. And it, it, that was true back then as it is now. Paul is talking to people who are persecuted, people who are being hunted down. And he says, nevertheless, this, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay. He's not saying never avenge yourselves because vengeance is bad. He's not saying that. He's saying, don't avenge yourselves because vengeance is the Lord's. Vengeance is the Lord's. Now, this is a hard teaching. This is a hard teaching. When, when we're insulted, when we are punched, our every instinct wants to punch back. But the saying here, what we're being told here in Romans and by Abigail is that if God will one day avenge all evil, then we don't need to avenge ourselves. We don't have to. God's got this. God will take care of it. Now, I want to bring an important caveat, just an important side note. Does this mean that Christians should give up hope of justice and vengeance in today's life, in the world now? Does this mean that we cannot find vengeance until heaven until Jesus returns? Does this mean that we ought to sit back and allow evil to happen? Does it mean that it's wrong to desire justice and to work towards it? No, not at all. No, because yes, while God will one day avenge all evil, while God will declare one day that vengeance is his and all oppressors and all those who trample upon God's anointed, on God's chosen people, well, all of them will face punishment. Before the final day, God has given us means of seeking justice now. Romans 13, the very next chapter says this, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger, who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Are you guys following? One day, God will take vengeance. One day on the final judgment day, God will avenge all wrongdoing done. Now, today, because of that, we don't need to take vengeance on our own behalf. If we don't have means to, we ought not to. And that doesn't mean that vengeance won't happen. It means that we just need to wait. It will happen. But nevertheless, right now, God has given us avengers. Not the avengers, but, but avengers. <laughs> God has given us means of seeking vengeance now. God has appointed authorities, people like our president, people like those in authority who have been given the job of avenging evil in fact, we'll see in 2 Samuel, the very next book, that David himself will execute godly vengeance. When David becomes king, God will command David to execute vengeance on behalf of those who seek justice. So it's not wrong for Christians to seek justice now, 
to appeal to the proper authorities to execute vengeance. It is not wrong to call the police. It is not wrong to appeal to a judge. It is not wrong to go to your boss. It is not wrong to file an HR complaint. It is not wrong to call out abusers. Vengeance and justice are not wrong. It is not wrong for Christians to want justice. But it is wrong for us to seek vengeance on our terms. It is wrong for us to seek justice by our own hands, outside of the means that God has laid out. When I was at, in college out in California, there was a campus group called By Any Means Necessary. By Any Means Necessary. They, they took that phrase from Malcolm X and then before him from Frantz Fanon, uh, the famous anti-colonial philosopher. And their whole thing was vigilante justice. Their whole thing was instigating and going out and saying, we will achieve justice by any means necessary, even if it means stabbing people in a protest, which they did. That's an extreme case. But we believers are faced with opportunities for justice, for, for vengeance, rather, every day in our own lives, to seek justice by our own hands. Every day, we have a chance to repay evil with evil. If a coworker takes credit for work that you did, then we have a chance to keep our eyes open, to watch for an opportunity, to get back at them the very next, very next chance. If someone in your friend circle insults you, talks about you and, and, and maligns your name, you have a chance that week to go up to everyone in your friend circle and to talk behind their back and to smear their name. If a family member cuts you out of the will or, or, or you know, uh, uh, excludes you from, from family meetings, you have a chance to likewise hit back. We see this all the time. With, with, I mean, we just, we just went through an election cycle. Politicians running attack ads against each other, calling each other the worst. The, 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 they're the Antichrist and they're the Antichrist. This is what, how our world operates. In a world where we don't believe that God exists, in, 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 a, in a world where, where God will not avenge, then the only chance of vengeance is if you take it yourself. But if we believe that vengeance is the Lord's, that God will one day avenge all things, and that right now he has given some certain prescribed means of achieving vengeance, then we don't have to do that. Again, if God gives you authorized means to seek a vengeance, by all means, seek it. But like in David's case, in today's story, those means may not always be available. This is the case for many in the oppressed world, for those who have no judge they can appeal to, for those who have governments who don't care about them, for those in the persecuted church. For them, the hope that David's example gives is that even if we can't get justice now, God has promised to avenge us, and so we don't have to work vengeance by our own hand. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, and David understands this. And so he listens to what Abigail says, and let's see how the story ends. Abigail persuades David to not destroy Nabal in his house. So the very next day, verse 36, Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he was holding a feast in his house, like the feast of a king, and Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. So she told him nothing at all until the morning light. In the morning, when the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him these things, and his heart died within him, and he became a stone. And about 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. So Nabal is thrown this huge feast. He's drunk out of his mind. And Abigail knows, if I tell him something now, it's just going to go in one ear out the other. So she waits till the morning, and when, when he's sobered up a little bit, she tells him, hey, guess what? David was going to knock out your entire household, but I convinced him not to. At that moment, Nabal's heart turns to stone. I think that's an ancient phrase for he had a stroke or something like that. He, he, he's, he's catatonic, and, and 10 days later, he dies. Verse 39, when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, blessed be the Lord who has avenged the insult I received at the hand of Nabal and has kept back his servant from wrongdoing. The Lord has returned the evil of Nabal on his own head. 
Nabal paid me evil for good. I was gonna pay him evil for his evil. But Abigail restrained me. I didn't have to do that. The Lord has returned the evil of Nabal on his own hand. Then David sent and spoke to Abigail to take her as his wife. When the servants of Ab- David came to Abigail at Carmel, they said to her, David has sent us to you to take to hit you to him as his wife. And she rose and bowed with her face to the ground and said, Behold, your handmaid is a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. And Abigail hurried and rose and mounted a donkey, and her five young women attended her. She followed the messengers of David and became his wife. Verse 43, David also took Ahanom of Jezreel, and both of them became his wives. Saul had given Michael, his daughter, David's wife, to Palti, the son of Laish, who was of Galim. We're not going to dwell too long on this, but this is the beginning of David taking many wives, um, becoming polygamous. And um, we're not told explicitly here that this is something God frowns upon, but in the book of Deuteronomy, this is something that the kings of Israel are strictly prohibited from doing. They are not to take many wives. And as we'll see in the whole second book, in 2 Samuel, this is going to have huge consequences for David. This is going to result in the collapse of his whole kingdom. Chapter 26 is kind of a repeat chapter. The events of this chapter are almost word for word what's going on in chapter 25. David is once again going to come upon Saul and have an opportunity to take him out. And David is not going to do it. David is going to restrain the hands of the people who tell him to kill Saul. And later he's going to tell Saul, look, I had a chance to, but I didn't. Except here in 26, verses chapter 24, David has learned his lesson. David does not almost get close to doing it. David's conscience does not have to restrain himself this time because David, after this whole episode with Nabal, has learned his lesson. He has learned that vengeance is the Lord's. We're not going to read the whole thing. But here in verse 9, David says again, David said to Abishai, do not destroy him, for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And David said, as the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him. Just like he did with Nabal, the Lord will strike him or his day will come to die or he will go down into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should take out my hand against the Lord's anointed. David's saying, look, I've learned by now that I'm not supposed to do this, but God will take care of it. God will take care of it. And so at the end of this whole section, at the end of of our text today, in verse 23, David declares this, The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I would not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. The Lord will reward every man for his righteousness. We are not to take vengeance into our own hands, Bridge. We are not to do what the Lord has said that we ought not to do. We are not to pay evil for evil, but to trust that the Lord, he's got this. King David learns this lesson in today's passage. But a more perfect king is coming. A son of David, who like David will be tempted three times in the wilderness. Who like David will be the anointed one. But unlike David, he will not have to learn this lesson. He will understand it perfectly. And he will be a perfect example to us of what we ought to do. 1 Peter 2 tells us this. For to this you have been called. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. He could have. He could have wiped them all out, but he didn't. He did not, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. He's talking about Christ. He's talking about Jesus, the son of David, who long after King David learns this lesson, he will not pay evil for evil. He will not threaten when he is crucified, when he has suffered unjustly but he will trust that God, the righteous judge, will one day take vengeance, 
will one day enact justice. And more than that, Jesus will take upon himself the vengeance of the Lord. Like Abigail, Jesus is going to take upon himself the guilt of all of us. Like Abigail, Jesus is going to forgive. He's going to make forgiveness possible. By his wounds, we are healed. Jesus is not only an example of what we should do in trusting the Lord's vengeance. Jesus himself is what makes it possible for us who deserve the Lord's vengeance, us who have sinned against the Lord and deserve justice to be brought down upon us. Jesus makes it possible for that vengeance to be paid, for it to be carried out. It was carried out on him on the cross at Calvary. Jesus is the perfect king, the perfect son of David. And so in him, we have hope that one day vengeance will be paid out and that we need not, yes, and that we need not fear this vengeance. Let's pray, Bridge. Lord, we long for vengeance. We long for justice. God, we see so much evil in our world. We see those who prey on the innocent. God, those who trample upon the poor. God, those who have abused, those who have neglected, those who have exploited, those who have insulted. God, we ourselves have been sinned against and we know that you know all of it. Lord, we trust you. We place our trust in you, acknowledging that we are in your hands. Lord, take vengeance. Lord, execute justice. We pray, Lord, that all of those, God, all of those who oppress, that they would be stopped dead in their tracks. God, that you would bring vengeance now. But God, as we wait, we trust that you will one day, that you will one day bring vengeance, even if it doesn't happen in our lifetimes. We thank you that vengeance is yours, God. We thank you that we don't have to take vengeance into our own hands. God, that we can trust you. That you have freed us to not live in anger and hatred. That we don't have to repay evil for evil, but that we can trust you. God, teach us now to repay good for evil. God, to forgive where we are mistreated. God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to take upon himself the vengeance that we deserve, the vengeance that we've incurred in sinning against you. Thank you for that. Thank you that, like Abigail, he's taken my guilt. We pray now that we would learn to live lives like him, lives like the son of David, not taking vengeance, not taking vengeance into our own hands, but trusting you, trusting your hand. And help us to do this hard, difficult task. Help us now. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.